Canine Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 145 of the Protection Dog Podcast. We already have some people hopping on on the Instagram side of the live feed. Good to see you guys. And um, so the Protection Dog Podcast is where we offer an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy. I'm your host, Joel Riles. Today is April 20th, 2023. We are streaming on Facebook. Uh, I'm trying on my Facebook profile as well as the uh, Fortress K9 Kennels page on Facebook. Uh, today we are on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and today we are on Instagram. So good to see you guys coming on. Uh, we always appreciate having you here. Welcome to everybody who is on the live with us as well as those of you who are listening to this after the fact. Today we are going to talk about the physiological and cognitive effects of stress, why you should uh, care about it, why you should care about the effects of stress, and how to train yourself to overcome these effects. So we'll be getting into those. This was originally episode 18. Uh, I have added to these notes uh, since that episode, but back then I called it uh, part three of training your subconscious. So we're going to get into how we do that and, uh, and what the effects and benefits of doing that are. Uh, good to see you found you on SOE. Didn't realize your company was so local. Oh, that's awesome. Where are you located? Uh, I see Fat Girl Chronicles 17 said that. So where are you located at? Um, all right. So I'll check back in in just a second there. Tonight I have my Tennessee Distillery Company Silk. It's a, a really smooth one. A whiskey, it has a lot of uh, similar flavor to Berry, Florida. That's pretty nice. Yeah, you're not too far away at all. So the Silk has a pretty good flavor, uh, comparable to like a uh, Johnny Walker Black Label. So it's, it's a little bit more smoky than that, uh, but it's nice and smooth, just like Johnny Walker Black Label is. So I uh, definitely recommend you check that out if you're up in the uh, Smoky Mountain area of Tennessee. All right. Um, before we jump into today's topic, let's talk about today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Fortress K9. Fortress K9 is building your fortress. We have personal family, family and executive protection dogs available. Um, we are actually uh, selling way more dogs than I expected right now this year. So uh, we're saving extra puppies from these litters uh, that are coming up. But what makes Fortress K9 different than most other places? Well, there's two primary things that make us different. Number one is our dogs are bred and trained to be with you and your family. So they are not high-end, crazy, like sport line Malinois and things like that. Some people want the higher drive dogs, and we do sometimes get higher drive dogs, but ours comparatively in the Malinois family um, are a little bit toned down compared to how crazy Malinois can be. So that's number one. Um, and then number two is our dogs are not apprehension dogs. They are not law enforcement dogs. We do not sell dogs to police departments and things like that. We sell exclusively to people like you, uh, normal citizens who want to increase their protection. And our dogs do not bite and hold. That's an apprehension technique. Uh, it puts the dog at risk. And, um, and so our dogs are taught to, as we call it, bite and fight, which means if they uh, are defending you and you send them to bite and somebody tries to strike them or stab them or use a weapon against them, they will release and retarget. And um, they also, if you're interested in getting multiple dogs, they work well together in teams of two and three. And um, there's very, very few other places that have dogs that will do that. So if that's something that you're interested in, uh, reach out and contact us. You can find out more information at our website, FortressK9.com. You can email me at Joel, J-O-E-L, at FortressK9.com, and you can text me. Remember, do not call me, but you can text me, and we can set up a phone consult if necessary at 813-836-9244. You can also message me on Facebook or Instagram. You can send me a, a comment on YouTube, but uh, if you want to make sure that I get you on one of those platforms, Instagram is probably the best one. Send me a DM over there. Don't forget to sign up for our email list if you're interested in keeping up to date on all our stuff. That's at FortressK9.com and K9Academy.us. If you're listening to this as a audio only, don't forget to check out the Fountain app at Fountain.fm. And uh, I won't beat that into the ground. I've mentioned it almost every week 
but it's a really, really cool podcast uh, listening app. All right, so tonight's training story. We're going to go over the tracking lessons learned today. So uh, I mentioned we had a couple weeks off because of a trip we did um, at the, what was it, the end of March. Um, and then we were kind of getting back into it last week. And so this week we were feeling pretty good. And I decided to take Punisher out. We did about a half mile track to start him off this morning. And I've been trying to get him to track and, and start his track off lead. So what's been happening previously is I take him out. Uh, if I don't put the lead on him, uh, I tell him to start seeking. And he thinks, oh, that means I get to roll around in the grass and run around and be a crazy puppy for a few minutes. And um, and so then I'd put the lead on him. And he'd be like, oh, we're working. OK, got it. And then he'd start uh, tracking. And then when I would get into the woods, I could take the lead off and he continued tracking well for me. So today was the first successful off lead uh, tracking start. So we win on that one. Uh, but then I let him hit air scent. And when he came back around, uh, he, he did air scent over to uh, where the other track was, but he hit going the wrong direction. And he went down maybe 50 to 100 yards somewhere in there and started kind of like, okay, this is confusing me now and um, had difficulty getting him back on the track. We ultimately found the guy, but the uh, two big lessons learned today are good job on starting the track off lead, um, but don't let him air scent and, uh, and jump tracks until he's better at hitting the, the proper direction. But in general, if you're tracking, air scenting is, um, is a risk, especially if you're out by yourself. So, um, but second tracks for both him and Loki, uh, today with Chip were awesome. The dogs both did great. Uh, we are super, super grown up back there. So we're like busting brand new paths all over again. Uh, all our old paths have all grown in. There's vines across them and all kinds of fun stuff. And the thorns and thistles and everything else are out in. Uh, they're all like loving this weather and this time of year. So they're going crazy growing in. And uh, so it's, it's pretty challenging back there for us and the dogs. Um, but they are continuing to progress and doing awesome. What is new on the dog stead? We got eggs. What did you guys name the eggs? My kids named the eggs. I know I, what they Jeffrey. have to name everything. Is it? I thought it was Jimmy and Timmy. Timmy and Timmy. They were like, what should we name them? I'm like, it doesn't really matter what you name them because we're going to be eating them very soon. And uh, they were asking, well, should we should we start collecting them for the uh, the incubator? And I said, well, here's the thing. I'm not confident yet that our roosters are mature enough to actually be um so it's the two older females that are laying the eggs now the younger females are not laying eggs yet and i don't think the roosters are mature enough to fertilize the eggs so we're going to wait about two months and we'll just collect our, our hopefully two eggs a day for two months and then we'll call out all but about three of the roosters so there should be two or three roosters get culled and, uh, and then we'll start collecting eggs to uh, incubate. And then we'll be adding to our flock. I'd like to build up to have somewhere between 20 and 30 birds. We'll kind of see how that goes. Uh, maybe not quite that many. It'll just depend. I think if we have three roosters though, we're supposed to have like 15 hens, something like that. So 20 is a, is a good kind of round number there. But that's what's going on on the dog stead, having fun with all that kind of stuff. Um, we're getting ready to put some new stuff in the ground. So in the next couple of weeks, you'll hear about that uh, in terms of plants and things like that. All right. Puppy litters coming up. MDK and Stryker have been bred. We expect their pups to be born mid-May and the puppies will be able to go home as basic puppies mid-July. MDK is a Dutch Malinois cross who shows Mally. And Stryker is a straight Dutch Shepherd. So we should get some good brindling and some uh, really, really strong Malinois lines in our Malinois pups in this breeding. So if you're interested in that, they are two of our hardest hitting dogs on ground. And both of them like to just snuggle and cuddle with their people. So that really good combo of great family dogs, but smashers when it comes to work. Um, if you're interested in getting one of those pups, reach out to me because I'm keeping probably half that litter on ground based on how many dogs I'm selling right now and I uh, need to make sure I'm getting new dogs into the training program. We also have Maeve and Riker. Both of them are black and tan bicolor German Shepherds. Both of them are absolutely gorgeous. You can see them on the uh, Instagram story highlights at our Fortress Canine Dot Puppies Instagram uh, channel. And uh, 
They will be bred and puppies are expected to go home approximately October 2023. We have Storm and Noel, that's a straight Malawa breeding, and um, they are expected to be going home in the approximate time frame of November. And then Reaper and Freya, a, a straight Dutch Shepherd line. Freya actually has some Mali blood in her, but she shows Dutch Shepherd. And, um, and then those will be going home approximately January 2024. So that is all of our breedings coming up this year. And if you are interested in getting in on any of those, reach out to me sooner rather than later because they tend to fill up quite a ways in advance of the pups being born. And um, the MDK Striker may be a, somewhat of an exception to that because I didn't advertise it at all before we did the breeding. So um, we'll see how that goes. But it's very rare that we have puppies available once there's puppies on the ground. So if you are interested in getting in on any of these uh, litters, make sure you reach out sooner rather than later. Don't forget, I'm going to be speaking at Prepper Camp September 22nd through the 24th. That is in Saluda, North Carolina, I think is what it, the name of the little town is. You can get more information, purchase your tickets at PrepperCamp.com. That's P-R-E-P-P-E-R camp.com. And um, check that out. We are going to be talking about self-defense, using dogs. We're going to be doing demos. You can come talk to us. You can meet our dogs, uh, give them some pets on the head, and just generally enjoy yourself. They have lots of other great speakers and information uh, that, where you can learn there as well. Uh, and the last kind of announcement is we are now on Noster. What is Noster, you say? Well, I don't really have time to explain it because I don't even 100% fully understand all the kind of back end of it. But if you would like to f learn a little bit more about Noster, go to tspc.co. That's short for The Survival Podcast, TSPC dot co and scroll down on that blog till you see the Noster initiative and jack uh over there at the survival podcast did an excellent uh he, he was a little off on his timing but the information is still excellent on that podcast he talks a little bit about what Noster is how to get on it and uh, and how to start growing a community there at Noster. his little catchphrase for it is one key pair and your tribe is everywhere Noster would be uh, the simple version of it, imagine being able to get on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all of the social media platforms that you currently use. And everywhere you go, all of the people that you follow are already there. You're already connected. And everybody who follows you can automatically already see you. You don't have to build an individual um, thing. Now, Nasser doesn't function with those social media platforms. This is a new thing being built up from the ground up. And, uh, but that's what it will be. They're building all sorts of things on the Nostra protocol, everything from like Twitter clones to sub stacks to um, marketplaces and all sorts of other things. So if you are interested in, um, in getting like being a, a front runner in the Nostra protocols, get on there, check it out. It's really cool. It is not super complex to get started. Uh, I'm not a developer, so I don't know any of that crap. I just know how to get on and use it. And it's been a, uh, a really cool experience. So uh, my pub key, you need a, you get two keys when you sign up, you get a public key and a private key. Your private key is your password. Never share your private key. Um, but your pub public key is what you share. And, and that's how you find each other. Uh, if you go to the description in my YouTube, uh, or the podcast description, my pub key is down near the bottom. You can scroll down and find the pub key and find me there on Noster. It's really cool. Remember, if you want to interact, please put it uh, your comment in all caps so I know you want me to respond to it. And don't forget to smash that like and subscribe if you're listening on YouTube. Um, and just like this or give it a thumbs up or a heart if you're on any of the other platforms real quick. Uh, just as good gear uh, as any chance we can meet the puppies before picking up. So um, what happens is uh, when the litter is born, everybody who's got reservations on that litter gets a text. I usually wait two to three days just to make sure sometimes you lose a puppy in those first two to three days. And then I send out a text saying, hey, the litter's been born. I usually do a little video and some pictures. And if it looks like we're gonna, we got a larger litter than expected or something like that, I uh, usually put that out on the email list that I mentioned earlier. And then uh, I continue to post, typically it's in the Fortress K9.puppies side. Uh, and I put a lot of stuff up in the stories. And I also do my daily posts uh, with a lot of the new pups that are on ground. And then at four weeks, 
is when we do selections, four weeks old. So if you want to meet the puppies before selection, um, you can come at four weeks. But at four weeks, I sent out a text saying, I need your top three choices for your puppies. And and we put little colored Velcro collars on the pups so that when you're looking at your puppies, you can be like, I like the pink one, the green one, and the red one, right? Whatever your, your three choices are. And uh, and we get you as close to your first choice as possible. <clears throat> so the uh, the selection criteria and all of that is over at fortresscanine.com forward slash puppies. And uh, so it depends on whether you're getting a basic or an advanced puppy. It depends on whether you paid in full up front or you just did your deposit. Uh, things like that, you know, you can kind of work your way up the hierarchy a little bit by uh, taking advantage of some of those options. And then, yes, if you want to meet them during the selection process, you still give me your top three, but you can come and you can actually play with them at four weeks old. Nobody gets to touch puppies but us until four weeks. But at four weeks old, you can come, you can hang out with us for 30 minutes to an hour, sit down and play with the puppies. We usually set up the X-Pen out in the grass and we bring the puppies out there and you can play with them. And um and then you can make your selections that way. So that is an option uh, when you're doing puppy selection. I appreciate that question. All right. Now to jump into the main topic of today's show, the physiological and cognitive effects of stress. First of all, what is physiological and cognitive for those who may not know? And that's totally fine. Physiological means your ability to manipulate your body, right? So uh, if you get shaky, right? Your, your hands are physically shaking. That's a physiological response. If you're getting tunnel vision, then, and, and your visual impairment is being uh, limited, that's a physiological response. It's things that affect your actual body. And then cognitive are things that affect the way you think or your, your capability of processing information. All right. So we're talking about how stress affects your body function and your ability to think. All right. Now, why should you care about the effects of stress? Well, you know, we are called the Protection Dog Podcast. We sell dogs that are protection dogs primarily. And we talk a lot about uh, planning and preparations uh, for self-defense, uh, for being in a fight, for having to deal with high stress uh, threat situations. Right. So that's obviously one of the reasons why you might want to care about stress and the effects of stress on your body. But another one is what if you're driving down the road and someone cuts you off in um, a pretty dense traffic? How are you going to respond to that? Well, if you have negative physiological and cognitive um, effects hitting your body in that moment, the chances of you making a bad decision and having an accident that at the very least does a lot of damage to your vehicle at worst does significant bodily harm to you and everybody else in the vehicle, um, that might be something worth knowing. Right. You might want to try and work through some of these problems and be aware of them before you end up in a situation like that. I've been in numerous situations driving down the road where people will just like large vehicles will just pull in front of me. Right. And, and literally I'm beside them. They're coming up in an on ramp and they just swerve right into the lane. And uh, and I've had to react to that. I've had many different situations happen while driving around. And, you know, my wife will sometimes complain about my driving when we're going on road trips and things like that. Stop texting. And um, you're swerving all over the place, even though like I'm mostly staying in my lane and not having any issues. But, you know, based on her uh, observations, she thinks I'm swerving. But then something crazy happens. I, you know, hit the brakes. I turn so much that I don't hit the guys over this side next to me, but I'm also not getting hit by the guys swerving in. I can break back and I can weave back into the spot I'm supposed to be in stressful, not fun, makes you upset, but we didn't get in a massive accident and nobody got hurt, right? And so by learning to deal with these effects, um, that's one of the benefits is something like a driving accident. Uh, it could also be other high stress situations. Somebody, maybe you find yourself in an active shooter situation, or maybe you find yourself in a medical situation, especially if it's a family member and those are much more stressful than a stranger having a medical situation near you, right? And how are you going to react? Are you just going to stand there dumbly, not knowing what to do? That's one of the cognitive um, effects of stress, right? That might be what you do. Or you learn how to deal with stress and somebody has a, a problem. They collapse on the floor. They can't breathe, whatever the situation may be. And you go, hey, it's time to act. Let's take care of this. You call 911. I'm going to grab this person. Uh, we're going to do the Heimlich maneuver or we're going to grab the... Um, 
the paddles to to do a uh, a heart rate reset, right? I can't think of the name of the paddles right now. IEDs. I can't remember exactly what they call it off the top of my head. Um, but they have these these little deals that are basically the equivalent of the paddles in the hospital. And you tape them on and you hit the button and it says, is everybody clear? Do you really want to do this? Yes. Is, is, he has no pulse. All right. Hit this button. And it uh, does a defibrillation set up on your heart. Right. So do you want to stand there, freeze and have the person have a significant medical issue? Or do you want to be able to act when the time comes and to be able to act in a way that's positive? I, yeah, IED is a. Uh, is an improvised explosive device. So it's definitely not that, Tracy. AED, that's what it is. I don't remember what it stands for, but it's an AED, like automatic something defibrillator. Um, anyway, moving on from my uh, little blunder there with the medical uh, equipment. So <clears throat> let's talk about the physiological effects of stress. So what happens in your body when stress level goes through the roof is primarily that you get an adrenaline rush into your blood system, your bloodstream, right? And when you get an adrenaline rush into your bloodstream, and I'm sure there's other hormones associated with this as well, but adrenaline, uh, things like cortisol, so you don't feel pain, right? Things like that. And what happens when this stuff floods into your, um, your vascular system is it goes through your whole body and it rapidly elevates your heart rate and your breathing. Okay, so this is good because there's a high probability that you're going to need to do something very physical and you're going to need to do it really fast. And you're going to need to have all of your strength while you're doing this physical thing. Right. So think of a self-defense situation. But what does that mean in real life? Right. So, OK, I got adrenaline. My heart rate and breathing went up. How does that actually physically affect my body? Well, one of the things that happens is you get shaky. And that's okay if you're doing gross motor skills, right? Like striking back at a person who's attacking you, okay? Or kicking or running, right? Things like that. If you're trying to conduct fine motor skills, like draw a weapon, come up on target and squeeze the trigger, you may have problems, right? If you are trying to drive your vehicle in a way that you have you know, only a couple of inches of room on one side and a couple of inches of room on the other side. You're trying to weave that little space that you have and, and you're also braking, but then not too hard, but not, and, you know, not, not enough, right? Hard enough. And you're trying to get to the spot you need to get. Sometimes the fine motor skills are very important in these situations. And if you're too shaky and you only have extreme gross motor skills, if all you're doing is running away, maybe that works. But if you need the more fine motor skills to function, then you could find yourself in trouble. Now, we're going to talk about some of the stuff you can do to have those fine motor skills, even without thinking about it um, at the end. OK, but that's you definitely get shaky and you lose your fine motor skills to a large degree. OK, and I'll, I'll just say it this way. If you have to think about any kind of fine motor skill, you won't be able to do it under stress, okay? So think about something like reloading a pistol, right? So you draw a pistol, you shoot, 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 and then you need to reload. If you are so stressed and you have not trained yourself that that reloading process is automatic, the chances of you effectively reloading or doing it without it taking an abnormally long period of time is very low, right? Both of those things are bad in a fight. So... We'll talk about how to deal with that at the end. Another physiological response that you get is tunnel vision. Okay. And this is one of the most common ones that people talk about is you get tunnel vision. Now, some people think, oh, I just kind of lose my peripheral vision. Okay. Under very light stress, that may be all that happens. Under extreme stress, think of it this way. I've got a straw that I'm looking through but I'm holding it six or eight inches away from my face and I can only see what's down that straw, right? It can be as small as this tiny little hole that you have way out and that's all, everything else just goes black, right? And the reason your body does that is because it thinks whatever the thing that I can actually see directly in front of me is probably the threat. So I'm going to give all of my attention to that and I'm gonna ignore everything else. The problem is in today's society, sometimes if you're in an active shooter situation, the threat's not right in front of you, right? The threat may be over there or over there or behind you. And there's all sorts of, of 
things that could go wrong because you're getting tunnel vision. Now, it helps to know you're going to get some tunnel vision. Even if you stress inoculate, which is one of the things we're going to talk about at the end, you will still get some tunnel vision. My tunnel vision right now comes down to right about here. So I lose a little bit of the peripheral over here and a little bit of the peripheral over here. Now, what do you do when you start to lose your peripheral vision? Or even if you get a fairly decent stress reaction and your, your tunnel vision is down like this, right? The way that you deal with that happening, first of all, it's very, very helpful to know that's what happens, right? That's what happens when you're under high stress. So if you don't know that's what happens, you panic. What the hell? I can't see anything. Um, you almost feel like you're blind, right? So if you get down to about this time frame, this range, the best thing to do is look around. Use your head and the movement of your head and look, 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 look. Because one thing that will also be happening during because of the adrenaline is your brain will be able to kind of remember what it saw when you were looking. Now, of course, when you're looking over here and something changes in this other space, you're not going to know that something changed, but your brain will take in all that information. OK, so when you, if you experience tunnel vision, one of the most important things that you can do is not keep your head in the same place. You do not keep just just looking ahead. You need to look, scan back and forth, up and down, right? Look behind you, all of those sorts of things. So you're probably going to experience tunnel vision. Excuse me. Do not panic and look around. Okay, just scan, scan, scan. Imagine wearing, if you've, if you've ever worn a gas mask, especially the kind that don't have the, the big face shield but have the, the two little eye holes in them, it's kind of like that. You lose a lot of your peripheral vision. So how do you deal with it? You look around, right? You look up and down and left and right. So that's how you deal with tunnel vision. Now, you can reduce the effects of tunnel vision significantly. You can reduce all of these physiological effects through stress inoculation, which we're going to talk about later. But you still have to deal with them to some degree, even if you stress inoculate. All right. So the first one was you get shaky and you lose fine, fine motor skills. The second one, tunnel vision. The third one, sometimes it really throws people off, but other times it just creates a void in the information that you're getting and you don't realize it. And that is auditory exclusion. Okay, now here's the most commonly recognized auditory exclusion. If you are a hunter, especially... If you don't get to hunt a lot, right? Like you're not out hunting all the time, going on like African safaris and all this kind of stuff. And you get to hunt once a year, right? Like you might go for a week or whatever, but like when the season comes, you get to go hunt and then you don't get to hunt for the next year. And you're out, you're walking around or you're in your tree stand and there it is. The buck, the elk, the moose, the caribou, the whatever it is you're hunting. I see it. This is so exciting. I get my rifle and I line my sights up and I pull the trigger and I hear no blast. I have no ringing in my ears. I barely felt the recoil. Why did all that happen? Because I had adrenaline in my system because I was so excited about finally I see the animal. I'm going to get to do this. Right? So, I experience that almost every time I hunt. I never have ringing in my ears from the gunshots. And I I hunt with a fairly lightweight rifle. So when you shoot it on the range after three shots, you're like, I am done. I don't want to shoot this thing anymore. I confirm my zero. I'm ready to just go hunting, right? It's it's ultra lightweight. It's a 338 federal round. So it's a 308 case necked up to 333 caliber. It's a really great hunting round. It kicks the shit out of you. It's like a, a sub seven pound rifle with the scope. And, um, and so it's not fun to shoot on the range, but when I'm hunting with it, I don't feel any of that recoil. I'll get home after a hunt, especially if I was successful and I fired a couple of times and I'm like, why am I all bruised up on my right side? Like, where did that big bruise come from? Oh yeah. I shot five caribou, you know, the last two weeks. So that's where that bruise came from. But in the moment I don't feel it and I don't hear it right? That's auditory exclusion. Now, where can auditory exclusion go wrong? Okay. 
It's important to know that auditory exclusion is a thing. Sometimes they try to present it in the movies like it comes and goes. I've never experienced the coming and going. If it happens, it tends to happen until the event is over. And um, But if you know that stuff like that happens, if you have team members, in the, okay, so a team member could be a spouse, your kids, like if you're on a law enforcement agency, it's, it's your actual team that shows up, right? If you're on SWAT team or something like that. But if you're still experiencing auditory exclusion under high stress, you need to be making eye contact with your team members, right? And you may even want to have some kind of a signal like tap your ears, like I can't hear you, okay? So be aware, auditory exclusion is a very real thing. Under high stress, you will probably not hear any gunshots. You won't hear the gunshots. You might hear the bullets zipping by, right? And if you've ever heard incoming bullets, you know what that sounds like. It's hard to explain. But you won't hear the blasts from your rifles and you may not hear the blast from theirs, okay? And it's weird because auditory exclusion is largely what's in your immediate area. Like sometimes you'll still hear the things that are farther away, but you won't hear the stuff right here, all right? And it's just important to understand that because if you see the blast from a shotgun, right? Like you're struggling with somebody, there's a shotgun between you and all of a sudden one of you pulls the trigger and you see boom, this big fireball blast out of the end of the barrel. And you're like, I heard nothing, right? Again, it's a potential panic moment. When you, if you're already under high stress and you panic on top of that, the stress goes even higher, which elevates all of the rest of these things. But if you're under stress and you understand that these things are very likely to happen to you and they start happening, you just go, oh, cool. Auditory exclusion. Got it. All right. Well, keep going. Right. And literally, I've had those thoughts under high stress situations where, cool, this is slow motion time. I know what's going on now. We're going to get to that in a minute. But um, but it was the first several times when I was a child, I experienced slow motion time. I panicked. Once I understood what it meant, I was like, sweet. I'm actually moving at full speed, but my brain is processing everything so quickly that it's like I'm moving in slow motion. This is really cool. Okay. So understanding that these things happen are very valuable uh, if you end up in one of these situations. The last physiological one is visual exclusion. Now, this usually happens when your vision is already somewhat impaired. All right. So if your vision, if you're walking around, uh, in the dark, you're more likely to have visual exclusion. Now, what's interesting about being in the dark is you're more likely to have visual exclusion and you're less likely to have auditory exclusion. In fact, you may have auditory amplification. I don't know if that's exactly the right terminology, but if, you're, if your eyes decide we are not getting any useful information from the eyes, actually your brain would decide that, we're not getting any useful information from the eyes, Shut that down. We don't need to process that information. Amplify auditory. And you may find yourself having almost like crazy superhuman hearing for a short period of time. Right. However, if all of a sudden you, you're like squinting your eyes and like, what the hell is going on? I can't see anything. Even though I know I've been out here in my backyard at nighttime, I can normally see out here. There's a light right there. There's a light over there, whatever the case may be. Why am I not able to see right now? Visual exclusion is a possibility under high stress. Okay. That, that's one that I particularly, I don't see a benefit to. I see only negatives to visual exclusion, especially if there's a threat, right? But it is one of the things that can potentially happen to you. Okay. So let's jump into the cognitive and then we're going to move into what can you do to train yourself to overcome these effects. So the cognitive the front of your brain is the part of your brain that thinks, right? So when you actively go, hmm, I wonder about this. And then your brain like starts to think, or you go, what's that person's name or phone number? Or how do I get to this particular store that I drive to sometimes? All of those sorts of things are contained up in the front part of your brain, right? So if, if a task requires you to think, think in order to do it, right? So this is a task that you know how to do, but you don't do all the time. 
Okay. So if you, if you're in your forties and you've been driving since you were 16, you no longer have to think about driving. You drive in autopilot almost all the time. The only time your brain, your, your frontal cortex activates while you're driving is if something out of the ordinary happens, right? Maybe like all of a sudden everybody starts slamming on the brakes. Then all of a sudden your brain goes, Whoa, what's going on here? Oh, I need to hit the brakes and you hit the brakes. Right. But in the, and if you drive in traffic all the time, you may not even do it then because your subconscious may go red lights mean hit the brakes. I don't even have to think about it. Okay. So, um, you want to train yourself and we'll get into this in more detail in a minute to do any kind of critical activities in the areas that you think may be likely high stress situations. You want to train yourself to do those things without thinking about it at all. Okay. Because you are going to have a significantly reduced ability to think and to reason under stress. This is also why immediately after a situation, right? You were not able to think. Your frontal cortex was essentially shut down. You're going to have memory gaps that will come back to you, but that you cannot recall right now. And so do if, if you were in a self-defense situation, do not talk to the police. The only thing you should be saying to police is, Here's my lawyer. You immediately, you train yourself to call your lawyer. And when the police show up, you go, here's my lawyer. And your lawyer will tell them something like, we will be happy to cooperate with your investigation in three days. Because it takes about three days for the, the memory gaps to fill themselves in. Okay. And these are all cognitive effects of stress. So in the moment, your ability to think and reason is significantly reduced and immediately following because of that, you're, you have these big memory gaps. Like people will say things like, how many rounds did you fire? No idea. Where did you go to? I don't know. Right. There's all sorts of the details of the situation that just happened that your brain will not recall. And if you make statements to people like the police immediately after, they go, well, were you lying? When three days later, your memory gaps all get filled in. And even though they full well know that these are cognitive effects of stress, they will use it against you potentially if you have to defend yourself later. So don't talk to the police. I am happy to cooperate in three days, but you shouldn't be the one saying that because you're not going to be able to think about it in the moment. You just train yourself, call lawyer. This happened. Police are coming. Here they are. Hand off phone. That's all you do. Okay. So that's the very important thing. Now, the other important thing to that is if there is a thing that you may need to do in this situation, you are not going to be able to think about it. So if you have to think about reloading your weapon, if you have to think about dealing with a weapons malfunction, a stovepipe, a double feed, right? Something like that, a failure to fire. If you have to think about any of those things, they will take you two to 10 times longer to actually do them under stress than if you can do them automatically. What does do them automatically mean? Okay. This is not frou-frou woo-woo shit. This is, this is how your brain works. You have a thing called a subconscious. Okay. A lot of people understand that like, oh, when I dream, my subconscious is thinking about things, right? But your subconscious does all kinds of things. So have you ever been listening to a CD or a, a album on, you know, Amazon music or whatever? You're driving down the road. This happens, especially when you're a little bit tired and you're listening to like the first song on the album and you're just driving, driving, driving. You listen to the song and then all of a sudden you're like, I'm on the eighth song in this album. And what the hell? I've just driven 20 miles, right? It's almost like you wake up from being asleep, but you weren't asleep. You were just fully on autopilot. 
your subconscious had taken over the music kind of puts you into this like almost like hypnotic state which actually does happen sometimes and you never closed your eyes you never actually went to sleep your subconscious was fully in control of what was happening but then all of a sudden it's like oh like i'm i'm almost at my exit right and you went like 10 15 sometimes 20 minutes in that state right i used to experience that a lot when i was not getting enough sleep right but your subconscious will do that your subconscious you can train it to boom 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 as soon as i feel that slide lock to the rear on a pistol and it's a different sensation it's it's not significant but it's different to when the slide goes forward right so normally the slide comes back it ejects the old cartridge the slide goes forward loads a new round into the chamber and then i can shoot again but when your magazine runs empty normally not all the time but normally the slide locks to the rear and you can feel that it it went back but it didn't go forward again and your immediate reaction without thinking at all is hit the magazine release grab a magazine from my pocket or my belt or wherever i carry my extra magazines in release the slide go back to shooting right and so if you have to think about that thing then what's going to happen best case scenario under high stress is you're going to stop moving but in a fight move movement is often what is the thing that's saving you right i'm behind this thing that's protecting me from the bad guy shooting at me and i need to run over to that thing that pr will protect me but in between i need to run well, if I try to stop and reload mid run, I will literally stop running. I will reload and then I will start running again. Right. So we want to get over. We, we want to train ourselves to have a subconscious reaction to running out of ammo, to have a subconscious reaction to having a stovepipe, to have a subconscious reaction to someone cutting us off on the road. All right. And we do that through repetition. Repetition, repetition, repetition. We'll talk about how to get those here soon because you can't just like go, hey, cut me off 200 times in a row. I want you to cut me off so I can learn to react to it, right? We'll get into that. But it's very important to understand your ability to think and reason under stress is significantly severely reduced under high stress, which creates memory gaps immediately following, all right? Then the other two things that happen cognitively are fast time, and slow motion time. Now, here's the theory behind fast time. Fast time is you did not train yourself to do any of the things that needed to be done in that situation, and you froze, and then the situation ends, hopefully you're not dead, and your brain turns back on because basically your, your ability to think shut down, and you froze. And then whatever happens, happens, and then the situation ends and your brain goes, okay, I'm back. What, what happened? Everything. It could have been a minute. It could have been 10 minutes. It happened like that for you. What that means is you have not trained yourself to deal with stress at all. Right. I'm driving down the road. All of a sudden I'm upside down in a vehicle. What the hell happened? Right. Whatever did happen, your stress level went to such a degree that you shut down and then you woke up and everything that happened in between those two things happened at like ultra high speed, right? That's fast motion time. That's bad. You do not want fast motion time, but that's how your brain will interpret it while it's going on, right? Time doesn't actually change. It's just that your ability to perceive how what's going on changes and you're basically what's happening is your brain is shutting down and going, we have no idea what to do in this situation. Just, just stand still and do nothing. Our best chance of survival when we know nothing is to do nothing and hope that we don't die. And that's what happens during fast motion time. So we definitely want to try and train ourselves that that's not what we experience. Now, what is slow motion time? I first experienced slow motion time. I was probably 10 or 12 years old. I can't remember why I was where I was, but I was in a position to cross. It was either a highway or an interstate. And traffic wasn't terrible. There were pretty decent gaps between vehicles. But when you're driving on the interstate, 
it doesn't feel as wide as it actually is, right? I, I think a normal lane on like a normal two lane road is like 12 feet for each lane, right? I think on the interstate, it's like 15 feet. And I think the average width of a, like a semi tractor trailer is like 10 feet wide. So that gives them like two and a half feet on either side, right? So if they veer this way a little bit or that way a little bit, they can still stay in the lane pretty decently. And so if you have a three lane highway or even a two lane highway with a shoulder and a, you know, the shoulders on either side, that's like 60 to 70 feet across. And when you're a kid, 60 to 70 feet, a decent distance, right? And so for whatever reason, I was a kid, I was in the 10 to 12 year old range, as far as I can remember, and I had to cross. And so there was this car coming, but right after the car passed, there was a decent gap, right? But the next vehicle, there was like a semi truck, a pickup truck and a car. Now they were a decent ways back, but that semi truck, I think it's pretty big when you're anything close to it, right? And so the car that was ahead of them, it whoosh passes me and we start running. And I'm like, dun, 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 dun. and I'm like, what the hell's going on? Dun, 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 dun. If you had not seen Chariots of Fire, you have to see that movie. Awesome movie about running. That's the theme song they play in the beginning. But I was like in slow motion running across this road. I'm like, what? Oh no, they're going to get here before I can cross the road because I'm going in slow motion. Why can I not run at normal speed? This is terrible. I didn't understand how physiological and cognitive effects of stress work. And as a kid, it was stressful that there was a semi. He was like down there a ways. It wasn't like he was about to run me over, but it was still like scary, right? To run all the way across this interstate with that semi coming toward me and I was stressed as a child. And so I experienced slow motion time. Now, once I learned about the physical and cognitive effects of stress, slow motion time is the best thing that can happen to you in a self-defense scenario. So we've been clearing rooms, clearing buildings and things like that. And we come into a room and I come in and I go, oh, look, that guy doesn't have a weapon. He's not a threat. In fact, he looks like he doesn't have anything to do with the rest of these guys. I'm going to, I'll check on him in a minute, but I'm going to leave him alone. I sweep across the room in slow motion and I go, oh, look, that guy has an AK-47. He's probably a bad guy. Boom, boom, boom. Sweep across the room. Oh, look, there's a woman and child huddled in the corner. We shouldn't shoot them. Sweep, sweep, sweep. Okay, room's clear. Come back and check on this first guy that was over there. Yeah, he's still huddled in the corner. Hey, you need to get on the ground. Show me your hands, blah, blah, blah. But everything, when I first go into a room, slows down into slow motion time. And if, if you don't know that that's a stress reaction, you panic. If you know that that's a stress reaction, you embrace it. And you go, this is awesome. I can see and process information and have reactions at almost superhuman speeds because everyone else is moving slow. Now that's not what's actually physically happening in real life. You're moving at normal speed in real life, but the adrenaline for you hits your brain in a certain way and says, process really, really, really fast, right? So you start processing this information you're getting at a hyper speed and your brain is interpreting it as slow motion time. Your actual movements are into the room, sweep, boom, 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 move across, sweep back, and I'm back and I'm checking everything out. Get on the ground, show me your hands, move and do all the things you're supposed to do, right? I still experience this when I do scenarios with, with the dogs biting, right? So uh, it, it was a couple of years ago, but the most recent time I had a definite slow motion time situation was we were doing uh, drills where I was deploying a dog, so the drill was deploy the dog on the bad guy, come in, grab the guy's arm, put him on the ground, get him under control. So we're like mimic, like handcuffing him, right? Tell the dog to out and plex right next to the guy, get him back on his feet. And then we're going to start taking him to our, our patrol car. And then he's going to break loose and start fighting again, which 
if he had handcuffs on, he couldn't do. But just for the sake of the drill, right, he starts fighting again. And then we have to get him under control a second time, right? And so I deploy my dog. Now, the guy that was in the suit was new to the suit. And he is a fucking crazy person, okay? And he, he's like, like some guys like him, blah, blah, blah. He was actually drafted in the NFL and ended up going Marine Corps. I think it was 9-11 type situation thing, right? But the dude did not know how to, like, go at a training level. Everything this dude did was at fucking 100%. And so it's like, okay, like, he's broken cops' ankles and stupid things like that in training because he doesn't know how to fucking train, right? He, he thinks everything's the real thing. So anyway, so I deploy my dog. My dog's biting him, right? I come in and I grab the guy's arm. And arm bars are not the most effective way to take people down. But if you know how to do them pretty effectively, you can kind of get somebody on the ground. So I grab his arm. I have his wrist in one hand. I have his elbow in my other hand. I lock out so that his arm's straight. And I go to drive him to the ground. And so his arm's back, you know, back like in, in an arm bar position. But he's a fucking strong guy. He's like six foot three or something like that. And he's just like rock solid muscle. And I'm five nine and I'm not like, the strongest guy in the world. Right. And so I'm trying to throw him on the ground and he basically looks over at me like, fuck you, man. You can't put me on the ground. So I realize this is not working. Right. So I'm trying to throw him on the ground and he just, he just locks up and stands straight up like, ha ha ha. You're not going to get to throw me on the ground that easy. So I'm like, all right, what do I do? So I, I swing around in front of him because my dog's still thrashing on one arm, right? So when I let go of his arm, he turns his attention back over to the dog for that split second. And I'm in front of him. So I like I jump up over his shoulder, put my arm around his neck in kind of a guillotine hold. And for a minute, I, my foot lands on the ground. So I've got his head locked in my arms. And then he goes, oh, you want to do that, huh? And he just fucking stands up and lifts my feet off the ground and I'm like hanging. I got this guy's head in my arm, but I'm like literally like feet dangling in the air. Like this is having no effect on this guy. So I let go and land on the ground and I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? Um, I should probably get behind this guy and try and take him down that way. So I duck under his arm and I jump up behind him, get him in a sleeper hole behind him, wrap my legs around his legs, he trips because my dog's pulling on him. He goes to his knees. He goes down on the ground. And then I get him in the in the control position, right? And in my mind, that took as long as it took to explain it to you. I don't know how long that was. 30 seconds, 60 seconds. I don't know how long it was. We were filming it. And so when it was all done, I went back because in my mind, it was a total clusterfuck. It was like, what the hell is happening here? Like, this dude didn't, like, I'm... You know, I could have done more force on the arm, but it's like if you do enough force, you actually physically break their elbows. Right now, he was strong enough. He probably could have just flexed in and kept me from actually hurting his elbow. But it's like in training, you're trying not to actually physically injure each other as a general rule. So I was like, I put enough force on him. He didn't want to do it. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to do that. I got him pretty good in the guillotine hold. But when he stood up, I lost the ability to wrap my legs around his waist. Right. So typically in a guillotine hold, you want to get control of the person's body with your your arms and your legs. And then when you flex back, it creates a lot of pain and they they want to give up. Right. They don't want that pain. And uh, but you can't it's really hard to choke someone out in that position. But from behind, you can choke somebody out in that position and you can wrap your legs around so they can't like lean forward and flip you off their shoulders. And then it also tends to trap their legs and make them trip and fall forward. OK, so it. In my mind, it took that long for all of that stuff to happen. When I watched the video, it was like a seven and a half second situation. It was like, boom, boom, boom. He's on the ground. You got control of his arm. And I'm like, that is not how that happened in my mind. That was way too fast. Right. But because I experienced slow motion time in that situation, I was able to process all of that information as I was going. This thing is not working. Try something different. That thing is not working. Try something different. This thing is working. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. Now I got it. Yes, success, right? And so when you experience slow motion time, it actually gives you an advantage as long as you don't panic. So that's the key. 
Okay, so how the hell do you train yourself to overcome these stress effects and at worst, you get slow motion time out of the deal? All right, there's three things that you do. Stress inoculation. What is stress inoculation? Stress inoculation is placing yourself in high stress situations enough times that that situation is no longer stressful for you. So this is the real difference between tier one operators, you know, the Delta Force guys. They call themselves CAG, by the way, Combat Action Group. Uh, they don't go by Delta. It's the Operational Detachment Delta in the CAG. And the SEAL Team 6, which if you use Delta Force and SEAL Team 6 in the communities, they know you don't freaking know anybody here because that's not what we call ourselves. SEAL Team 6 is dev group the development group in the Naval Special Warfare section. And if you work with these guys, the real difference between them and everybody else is their training that they do all the time is what most other people would consider ultra high stress situations. Live fire, full action events, sometimes with other team members in the positions like sitting in chairs and things like that. And they're coming in live fire in the room and being graded four time on hit placement, firing live rounds, and they can't shoot the other people sitting in the room. Right. And literally they're like putting index cards on the targets with dime sized dots on them. And if they, you know, whoever is the farthest off the dime sized dots end of, of situation scenario that they're running buys everybody rounds at the bar tonight, right? So this is the level of training that they're doing. And what it does is it takes these situations that most of us would view as really high stress and it makes them boring and mundane to these guys, right? So that it takes a situation that's so much more stressful than that for them to start having these stress reactions that most of the situations they find themselves in they're able to deal with fairly well because they've inoculated themselves to that level of stress. Okay. Now, most of you are thinking, well, damn it. I can't do that kind of stuff. I can't put myself in those situations often enough that I can just be inoculated to stress. Like how the hell am I supposed to train myself to do this? Here's how you do it. And it's like 80% as effective as what the tier one units do. If you'll do it. And they actually do this in addition to as well. But it's something that you can do. And you don't have to fire 10,000 rounds of live fire ammunition a month. And you don't have to spend, you know, months and weeks of training. You just have to do this on a relatively normal, regular basis and do it as realistically as possible. Mental scenarios. Mental scenarios. And when you do a mental scenario, I have whole podcasts on this. I'm actually going to scroll down here because I'm on my notes. I'm going to scroll, scroll, scroll down. And real quickly, I'm going to see uh, episode 143. So just two episodes ago, I have a whole hour and something long podcast on training your mind for self-defense through scenarios. And we go into detail on how to go through and train yourself for these scenarios. All right. Run mental scenarios. When you're driving to work in the morning, run mental scenarios. When you're driving home in the evening, dr run mental scenarios. When you lay down for bed at night and you're about to go to sleep, run a mental scenario, right? If you're at lunch and you're not like actively engaged with another person, run a mental scenario. There's like three to five times every single day that you're probably doing something mindless that you can run a mental scenario. And when you do this, the way that I teach you to do it in episode 143, you will be training your subconscious. So here's one of the cool things about your subconscious. Your subconscious does not know the difference between make-believe and real life. So when you run mental scenarios, what you're actually doing is training your subconscious. And 
there is a there is some degree of necessity of actually understanding what the real situation is going to be like right so maybe going to like one really good training course on dealing with you know like active shooters is important so you, you're like, okay, got it. Like, I know what that situation is going to be like to a large degree. So when I run my mental scenarios, I can be accurate in my mental scenarios. But I even talk about how to do that yourself if you can't go to training, okay? Run your mental scenarios. Run them over and over and over and over and over again. And when you run a mental scenario, run it from, don't run it from the door getting kicked in. Run it from, I'm sitting watching tv what do you do in the evening do you sit and watch tv do you always have dinner and read to your children do you and your wife do a particular thing you and your husband do a particular thing before bedtime what thing is normal for you that's where your scenario begins boom this is where we are this is a normal event in our life this is a thing that's happening all of a sudden boom out of nowhere scenario starts and then you run the scenario through, it's not just, and then they ran out of the, front, the door, right? Or I shot him and he was dead. The scenario runs through, the police show up. How do you interact with the police? What do you do if they arrest you? What do you do if they don't arrest you? Blah, 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 right? And each of your scenarios, when you run them, needs a little bit of a tweak. How do you know what tweak to make? You ask yourself this question. Okay. I ran a scenario. What could go wrong? What thing could mess up that plan I just did in my head? Maybe the police say, mm, we're not sure that was self-defense. We're actually going to arrest you right now. Or maybe the situation is instead of three guys, there were four. Well, where did the fourth guy go? Well, what if the fourth guy went this way? Well, what if the third guy went that way? Well, what if they came in a different entrance? Well, what if we were in this situation in traffic when our vehicle got attacked versus that situation, right? And you you make these little tweaks. What could go wrong? What other situations could we find ourselves in? So as you're running your scenarios, you may run a home invasion scenario a hundred times, but each time there's a little tweak to it. You may run your vehicle attack scenario a hundred times, but each time you're maybe at a slightly different location. Maybe your kids are with you in one and they're not in another there's all these little tweaks you can make to your mental scenarios as you're running them. But here's the thing, especially in the beginning, once you do them for a little while, you'll stop experiencing this, but you know, you're running an effective mental scenario. If this happens, you get a really bad feeling in the pit of your stomach and, or you get a tingling going from like, your mid spine is typically where I feel it all the way up to your brain stem. And it's like this little tingle. And in fact, talking about it right now just made it happen to me. That's a slight adrenaline rush. You know, you have an adrenaline rush if you feel from your mid back, sometimes all the way down to your, to your tailbone. But for me, it's typically mid back. I feel like a little tingle go whoosh up and then it kind of hits my brain stem. And it's almost like, like a firework. It like goes bloosh, and I kind of feel little tingles all over the back of my head. Okay. When that happens, I know I'm experiencing that situation. So I've actually had to induce that in some of my clients that I'm training when we're, I'm like, hey, your protection dog is not going to protect you unless there's an actual situation to protect you from. So we are training. So you need to put yourself in that situation. And they're going things like, oh, yeah, watch them. Like, uh, uh, you should take them. Uh, and they just, they've never been in a situation enough to be able to like imagine the situation in their head and uh, like place themselves in that situation. And weirdly enough, the women tend to not have that problem as much as the men. So I've had a couple of times when there's a guy and he's just like, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing, man. I'm like, yeah, watch him. And I've had to go, if this dog doesn't fucking bite me, I'm literally going to rape your wife in front of you. And all of a sudden they'll be like, what the fuck did you just say? And they had to have that trigger in their mental scenario because they, they weren't willing to put themselves there, right? When you run your mental scenario, imagine your worst case scenario and voluntarily go there. It will suck the first couple of times. 
then you will start to become comfortable with it. And then you will be able to think through how to deal with almost any and every situation that you can come up with in that scenario. But if you're not willing to face it, if you're a single woman, what are you going to do if someone kicks your front door in and there's three guys coming in and they are going to rape you? Run the scenario from beginning to end. What will you do? How will you win that situation? And if you're not willing to deal with the, the mental trauma that that does create, you will not be able to mentally use scenarios to train yourself to deal with that situation. But if you will deal with it, if you will face that fear, even though the first couple of times you're going to be like, oh, fucking pit in my stomach. Oh, don't like it. No, don't want to deal with it. Don't want to think about it. If you will actually go through that situation and deal with it, you will start to become comfortable with it. And then you will actually train yourself to be ready for that situation should it happen. All right. So we have stress inoculation. That's through repetitive actions under high stress. We have mental scenarios, which is imagining the high stress and then training our subconscious on what to do through that situation through repetition. And then the other thing that will happen is in any of these situations that we've been talking about, there are certain basic critical skills that you need, right? So if you have a firearm, some of your basic critical skills are reloading, dealing with malfunctions, right? Um, if you are driving, some of your basic critical skills may be um, your, your steering capabilities, your awareness of how close to a guardrail you can get, right? Things like that. And you need to train and rehearse basic critical skills until they are automatic. And you know when they're automatic because you at that point they are subconscious. You no longer have to think about them. So here's a good example in a shooting scenario. So I used to help some buddies do shooting courses and we would teach them, here's how you do a reload, right? And they'd reload, they, you know, the drill would be something like fire two rounds, drop your magazine, reload, fire two rounds. And we practiced that over and over and over and over again, right? Until they got to the point where they could, they could reload pretty decently. And then we go, um, okay, we're going to deal with failure to fire drills. So we would load their magazine with like five or six rounds. And at some point in that, we would put a round that wouldn't fire, right? Sometimes it was just a casing. Sometimes it was like a snap cap kind of a thing. And so they'd be going boom, boom, click. And they had to practice. What do you do when you pull the trigger and nothing happens, right? Rack the slide, fire again. Okay. And then we'd say, okay, so now you've been standing here on this range doing these little drills. Now what you're going to do is you're going to start walking and you're going to be standing behind this one barricade and you're going to fire from this barricade. And then you're going to walk quickly to that next barricade. And while you're walking, you're going to fire two rounds. You're going to drop a magazine, reload, fire two rounds, and then get behind the barricade. Okay. The idea is you have to continue moving the entire time from one barrier to the other barrier. Every time the first time we would introduce that drill, they would move, fire their two rounds, stop, reload, start moving again, fire their two rounds, get behind the barricade. They stopped because they had in one or two days, you're still not fully trained to the point where you can do that reload without thinking about it. So why did they stop? Because their brain had to freeze their motion. Your brain cannot do two things at once. So if you're thinking about running and you're thinking about reloading, you can only think about one of those at a time. So you're running, 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 freeze, switch attention to reloading, do the reload, back to running, run across. Well, in a fight, that's a bad situation. That basic critical skill of reloading the firearm needs to be able to be done without thinking which means you have to train yourself so that while you're running, you can drop magazine, reload, and you're still running, and then you're behind barricade and you're shooting again, right? And so you have to train and rehearse basic critical skills. So the first thing you need to ask yourself is, what are the basic critical skills I need? So you start running your mental scenarios, or you start doing actual training scenarios via stress inoculation, and you go, whoa, we really screwed up here. What went wrong? 
right? Because if you're running your scenarios mentally or in in like a training environment and you're getting it right every time, you're not doing it right, right? You should be screwing up constantly. And when you screw up, you go, what happened? So we, we in the army, we call it an AAR, action, after action review. You go, what went right? What went wrong? What are we going to do next time? Right. And we typically would limit it to like three things so that you don't get overwhelmed with a million things. So what three things did we do? Good. We did this good. All right. Great. We did that good. All right. Cool. We did this good. All right. That was we, you know, we didn't screw everything up. Right. What did we do wrong? Well, um, when these guys went around, we didn't realize they were over there and then we shot our own team members. All right. Well, how are we going to keep that thing from happening in the future? What are we going to do next time? Right. And as you're going through your stress inoculation, actual physical training and your mental scenarios, you go, what things am I doing in this scenario or what things am I doing in this actual training situation that I'm going through? What do I need to do without thinking about it? I keep using reloading as an example. And that's a really good one, right? But if you have a dog with you, a lot of your dog handling skills have to be automatic. I don't even have to think about it. A lot of your verbal communication, both with your team and with the bad guy, have to be automatic so that you don't think about it, right? And you tend to add these things on in layers, okay? But don't neglect the layers. So start basic. What things do I need to do? Okay, so I start practicing those skills. And you can practice those mentally too, right? Close your eyes. Envision. You should be familiar enough with your firearms if you're going to envision reloading drills that you know the feel of the gun. You know exactly where your magazines are stored. You know what it feels like to reach down and grab them, right? So you have to practice that, you know, maybe 20 to 100 times, somewhere in there. And then you can start mentally envisioning it. So you close your eyes and it's like, boom, boom, I feel that shot. I feel where it locked to the rear. Immediately hit the magazine release button. I draw my magazine. I slam it forward. I always hold my magazines the same way coming out of my magazine pouches so that I can guide with my forefinger right up to the uh, grip of my pistol. I slam it in with the heel of my hand. I flip my pistol over. I grab the slide so that I can release it and I drive it forward and then I can start shooting again. Okay. And I do that over and over and over and over again in my mind mentally. And my subconscious will learn to do it for real without thinking about it. All right. So how do you train yourself to overcome these effects? Train yourself in stress inoculation. One of the additional ways you can do that without actual physical situations is mental scenarios. Again, episode 143. And train and rehearse basic critical skills until they are automatic, meaning you can do them subconsciously. All right. So let's check some of our comments. We've got eight comments over here on the... Uh, YouTube side. So let's see. We have John Rice. I'm here on time. Yay. Maybe your internet will hold lots of laughs. Um, so awesome. John Rice is a great guy. He's almost always here. I appreciate you being here, John. Uh, Pip and I says, drove out to Daytona and back and watched the F-250 with a trailer of a front tire blowout. Stuff happens quick. Yeah. If you've ever been driving down the interstate and seen a front tire blowout, that affects your steering substantially, right? Because one of the two tires blows out and the drag on that tire wants to jerk your wheel to that side and it takes a lot of force to bring that tire that steering wheel back straight and even then it still wants to drift in that direction that can be a pretty rough pretty bad situation and so that's just one of the many situations that you could very realistically experience and understanding and knowing how to deal with high stress situations um can make a huge difference in how you react and whether or not you end up colliding with that person and in a significant vehicle accident or avoiding that accident. And while going, whoa, ha, that was stressful, but whew, we made it. All right, continue on with our day, right? So I appreciate that example, Pip and I's. And then uh, Robert sent a couple of like dots and commas and stuff. So I uh, appreciate you being here, Robert, And but I don't know how to respond to that. So remember, if you guys uh, have any comments while we're going through these at the end, uh, please put them in all caps so I know that they are for me. Um, so we had some great people on. We've got some people local. 
Fat Girl Chronicles. I hope to uh, meet you guys, meet you sometime soon. It said earlier you found me through SOE. So if you are ever at the uh, Self Reliance Festival, which is at the SOE compound, um, there, we're going to be at the one in October. At least that's the current plan. And uh, would love to meet you. Come up, introduce yourself, and let me know what your screen handles are. Because sometimes people introduce themselves at these events, and they're like, "This is my real name," and I'm like, "Oh, it's great to meet you." And sometimes you, you just see a little bit, kind of like, mm, I, you know, I've been like talking to you a lot online and stuff, and you didn't really like recognize me." And that's because your screen name has nothing to do with your real name, which I appreciate. But if you have a screen name that's not your real name and you introduce yourself by your real name, make sure you go, I'm this screen name on Instagram or YouTube or whatever. And I, I mean, I still 100% be there, but it will help out a lot if you guys do that. But I love meeting you guys at the events when you guys come and shake our hands and pet our dogs and all that good kind of stuff. So we already dealt with the puppy question, but we had a question earlier about any chance we can meet the puppies before picking up um, because we have some litters that we were announcing uh, coming available this year. If you're interested in getting one of our puppies and you want to know if you can meet the puppies before uh, the selection, what happens is we do puppy selection at four weeks old. So at four weeks, you need to schedule to come and visit us You know, within one to two days of that four week mark and we will let you come and see the pups and pet them and interact with them and then when you make your selections you will have actually physically been able to see them now you know some people are able to do this some people are not it's fine either way if you're not able to do it and you have a particular like temperament you're looking for i want a really badass dog okay then i'll help you pick out one of the ones in the litter that are more like hardcore right if you're like i need one that's like more toned down for our family i'll help you pick one that's a little more calm but if you want to get out and see them that is definitely a possibility we do that at four weeks because four weeks is selection time for everybody and um and so that is definitely an option but you need to make sure you're scheduling that pretty uh specifically and uh and then i was trying to remember what the aed the automatic whatever defibrillator thing was we were talking about that earlier in responding to a medical emergency and uh, tracy said an ied is going to mess you up that's right because ied stands for improvised explosive device which i only have experienced one of those and it was a fairly small one in iraq and uh, that still wasn't fun it was two 60 millimeter mortars uh, connected together that were command detonated when we drove into a uh, intersection and uh, they started shooting from the rooftops down on our vehicles and thankfully we had trained enough that we knew you do not stop and shoot back you just go 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 through that situation none of our vehicles were um, disabled where they couldn't drive and uh, and i was in the third vehicle i think yeah i was in the third vehicle so as i was swinging my m240 bravo around on the rooftops and seeing them run up with their ak's and get ready to start shooting at us a couple of the guys up there had um uh, rpgs which are rocket propelled grenades which is kind of like people think about a bazooka or something like that. it's like a little bitty rocket that shoots and blows up when it hits its target right and uh and so thankfully we were able to get all of us around the corner and out of the way before they could shoot any rpgs at us but uh yeah ieds are definitely something uh you don't want to deal with if at all possible uh and then um i believe this is tracy said muscle memory there at the end when we were talking about doing scenarios and stuff like that that's how people usually refer to it they say muscle memory what muscle muscles don't have memory right your muscles do not have any memory there's no brain in your muscles that remember oh we do this thing what does have memory is your brain and your brain says hey we recognize that slight variation in the way that your weapon just recoiled we need to reload and it does it it controls your muscles and so while i don't mind the term muscle memory um it's just important to understand what you're actually doing when you develop quote unquote muscle memory is you are training your subconscious to do a thing so that you don't have to think about it anymore. And, and we've all experienced this. You guys do things, if whatever it is in your life that you do all the time, you do routinely, like almost every single day, you will do it without even thinking about it. And so if you start paying attention to that, you're like, oh yeah, like I do this every day without thinking about it. I do that every day without thinking about it. A, a example that probably everybody experiences is when you get home from work, 
and you park your vehicle and you get out of your vehicle and you walk inside, I bet you do that on autopilot almost every single day. The only exceptions to that might be when you go, hey, I've got groceries today and I have to go in this other door because that's the door that leads into the kitchen and I have to put everything in the fridge, right? But if you're doing a normal daily exercise, you do it without even thinking about it. And that is because your subconscious has been trained to do that. And then uh, Dadius Maximus says, yeah, parents didn't name me Dadius Maximus. That's right. So um, with, with, I think we've actually met in real life. But um, yeah, when I get introduced, if you use a different name than your, your screen name, I, I'm so happy to meet you, but I don't, and I've had this happen too. People come up and introduce themselves and, and I'm like, oh, cool to meet you. And we hang out, like we talk, you know, for a couple hours over the weekend or whatever. And then like a week or two later, they're interacting on these, these media that we're on as their screen name. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we met at the event like two weeks ago. And I'm like, okay, that still doesn't help me. Like, I don't know who the person I met, because I met like 100 people in that weekend is versus like the screen name that I'm seeing right now. Like, you got you to gotta still draw that connection together. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I don't have a huge following or anything, but uh, it's enough people that it's kind of like, uh, I want to make sure I like actually like interact with you as a person. And so if you have a screen name and you do interact fairly frequently, uh, make sure you let me know that so that I can kind of keep my eyes open for that. So, hey, fellow 240 operator. <laughs> yeah. So I actually got lucky on that. I was an officer in the army. And so officers don't get to do the cool stuff. Right. And uh, but I was attached to what were called a Nippet team. So it was a national police transition team helping the Iraqi national police supposedly be able to like operate on their own. Right. So this is a mission that normally special operations guys would do. But they were busy with all the other operations that they do that they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll teach you guys three months on how to do this one job and then you go do it. And so uh, we were attached to a battalion of national police and we we're going through and doing stuff. Well, we're a 12 man team. And so we actually got three additional like specialists attached to us when we got there because you had to have four vehicles. And, uh, and so we had like a medic, we had, and then beyond that, we were like 50, 50 officers and enlisted because we were dealing with all their officers and senior enlisted guys. Right. And, uh, and so when we would run patrols and we would be doing things out on uh, outside the wire, um, they wanted me to TC at first for those who are not like military people. TC is I'm in the passenger seat of the vehicle and I'm it, TC technically stands for tank commander, but we use it generically as you're the guy who's in control of this vehicle but you can't be doing any of the things that operate the vehicle if you're in control, right? So there has to be a driver and his job is to drive. So the TC may go, turn left. And then the driver turns left, right? Or the TC goes, go, go, go. And the driver hits the gas and goes. And then you have a gunner and the TC goes, you know, watch our three o'clock. And you swing around to three o'clock to see what the threat is there. And you may engage with that threat at three o'clock, right? So that's the TC's job. He's on the radios and he's communicating to his, his crew. And then you have a gunner and you have a driver and then sometimes you have other passengers, right? And so I TC'd for about a month and I was like, this position sucks. If we're going to get shot at, I want to be in a spot where I can actually engage back. So I put somebody else, I can't even remember who I put in the TC spot. And I was like, I'm gunning. And, uh, and so for the 12 months that we were down range, I gunned for about 10 months of those and I loved it. Uh, we had a 240 Bravo on our vehicle. So that was the gun I, I ran. And, uh, and then I had my other gear up in the turret and everything and got pretty good at the remote control on the turret and all that fun stuff. So, um, yeah, it was, I, I really enjoyed that deployment for the most part. So, uh, next level K9. Awesome to see you on, man. I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you didn't hear everything, you can scroll back and go through. We're going through the uh, physiological and cognitive effects of stress and how to train yourself to deal with those in a high stress situation. All right, guys, uh, real quick. Let me pop over here. Uh, I define muscle memory as your brain's memory of what the muscles need to do. That's exactly right, John Rice. So I just I don't know why I feel the need to communicate that your muscles don't have memory, but you're basically training your subconscious. That's what you're doing. So because generally what we do is we don't think of, Hey, I've done this task like 10, 20 times. So I know how to do it. Like I know how to make bread. 
right? I, I know that let, let's say I have the grains and I'm going to grind the grains and I'm going to mix the bread stuff together. And I'm going to let it rise and beat it down a couple of times and I'll put it in the oven. I know how to do all those things. I've done them enough times that my brain, my memory knows what needs to happen, but I still have to stop and think about it, right? I may start to go, how much yeast do I need again? And how long do I need it to rise? I There's a process in my brain that still has to go, I need to stop and process information in order to actually be able to do this thing that I'm trying to do. True subconscious training is a thing happens and it triggers a reaction and you do the reaction without thinking about it. So an example might be I'm driving down the, the road, maybe I'm on the interstate, it, you know, going home from work and I'm looking down at my radio, pushing some buttons or maybe changing the, the AC on my, in my car. And then all of a sudden I just hit the brakes and then I look up and I realize everybody's on their brakes. Why did I do that? Because out of the peripheral vision of my eye, the, the brake lights of other people came on and my subconscious went, that means brake. And it hit the brakes before I even thought to do anything. That's when you have true quote unquote muscle memory or your, um, your subconscious is, has been trained to do a thing. So hopefully that kind of like clarifies what we're talking about there, John. Uh, and then, uh, Scott's on, on Instagram or on uh, YouTube. He says on combat by Dave Grossman was the greatest combat psychology prep that I have ever utilized. Okay. So everything that I just talked about tonight, I learned from a, it was on cassette. Right. So this is how long ago it was. It was cassette and there were two cassettes. So you would listen through all of one side of a cassette. You'd flip it over. You'd listen through that. And then you get cassette number two and you had to do the same thing. Right. I listened on cassette over and over and over and over again. A talk called The Bulletproof Mind. And he had, he had a lot of other examples and things like that. But the Bulletproof Mind was a presentation that Dave Grossman, who Scott just referenced, uh, who is the author of On Combat. He's also the author of On, uh, I think it's On Killing. And, uh, and then he also wrote one, Stop Teaching Our Children to Kill. And that one is about like uh, violent video games and stuff like that. And so he has several books that are really great. But he would go around and do these presentations primarily to like law enforcement military guys, right? And he would explain these, these physiological cognitive reactions of stress and how to train yourself to get through them. And uh, so I would listen to the Bulletproof Mind over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I would run those mental scenarios over and over and over and over and over again. And when I deployed downrange, that made probably one of the biggest differences uh, between me. And I, I had uh, two infantry NCOs and two infantry officers in our team. And I was training them on combat techniques. Cause we would get in, we would do our, you know, be going through our training before we deployed down range. And it's like, all right, you guys know how to do this when you're cleaning a room. Right. And they're like, what? No, we don't know how to do that. And I'm like, you're fucking infantry. How do you not know how to do that? Like all you guys do is train. And they're like, nobody ever taught us, like, infantry guys don't carry pistols, and we carried pistols. So they didn't know how to transition from a rifle to a pistol. And I was an MP officer, and I just had trained a lot on how to transition from rifle to pistol. So I'm like, all right, guys, this is how you transition rifle to pistol. And then we just go through it over and over and over again, right? And things like that. So um, listening to the Bulletproof Mind numerous times made a huge difference. You may still be able to find it someplace. Hopefully it's not on cassette anymore because I don't even know if you can buy a cassette player anymore. But um, yeah, that same guy, Dave Grossman, is an awesome author. And um, I need to look and see if I can find On Combat as an audiobook because I bet that would be really good. Um, and then John commented here, I processed rabbits on mushrooms once. Had to stop and think about what I was doing first. Once I got my first step, it was automatic. So I've only done mushrooms one time and I got what was apparently a pretty small dose. And I'm like, it was kind of cool, but it was something that I'm not necessarily interested in doing again. Um, but I think that guys who want to do that kind of stuff, totally cool with, uh, you know, you want to have some fun. I mean, I've been drinking my whiskey the whole time. So, uh, and I'll have another three, maybe four of these tonight before I go to bed. So. <laughs> Um, it is what it is, right? All right, guys. I've really uh, enjoyed being on with you. I love the comments. 
Uh, if you enjoyed this show and the content that we're producing, and you'd like to support us, please give us a thumbs up, a like, a heart, a whatever platform you're on. Uh, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe. And there's a little bell next to the subscribe thing. You can click on that and it will tell you when we're getting ready to go live or any new content has been posted. I typically do three posts a day uh, on all of the platforms. Um, on Instagram and YouTube, there's individual channels. We have Fortress Canine, Fortress Canine Dot Puppies, and Canine Academy Dot US. Um, so I post on those individual ones on Facebook and Instagram. All the rest of the platforms we're on, we are on YouTube, Truth Social, MeWe, Gab, um, one called Freesteading, and we are on Noster now. And all of those get all of the other three, and then we do our evening motivationals. Uh, on Instagram stories and then on all the other platforms just right in the standard feed. So um, if you're interested in hopping on and getting that information on YouTube or any other platform, I really appreciate it. If you like them, if you share them, you tell your friends about them, all that good kind of stuff. Follow me on Noster. If you've not heard about Noster, I highly recommend you go to tspc.co stands for the survival podcast.com, but it's a abbreviated version T as in Tom, tspc.co. Scroll down till you find the Noster Initiative. Listen to that episode. He tells you how to sign up. He tells you what it is. And he gives you a little cool thing that he's starting called Grow Noster, where you can get a really cool variation in the kinds of information you get on Noster. Uh, we are on Noster. My pub key, which is essentially your username, is in the uh, description below this on YouTube. And on the podcasting platform, I imagine it's in the Facebook one as well. On uh, Instagram, it is in most of, if you, it won't be on this um, write up, but if you go to any of my other write ups on the Fortress K9 side and scroll down, my pub key for Noster is in those write ups. And uh, so I'd love for you to follow me over there. There's a lot of cool stuff happening there. Don't forget to check out and share our websites, FortressK9.com and K9Academy.us. Don't forget to check out the Fountain app. If you're listening to this on audio, it is fountain.fm. It is basically a podcast audio app that you can interact with each other. You can comment. You can make clips, which is short little segments of podcasts that you like. If your podcasts that you like to listen to are on Apple Podcasts, they are in the Fountain app. They uh, That's where they pull their primary stream from is the, um, the Apple Podcasts. Uh, whatever the feed is that that, that goes through. And uh, so if they are there, which practically any big podcast is, then you will be able to find them on Fountain and uh, and you'll be able to listen to them. And you'll also get sats, which are tiny little uh, fragments of Bitcoin. And you can send them, receive them, play around with them, have fun, even if you don't want to collect and buy Bitcoin. Uh, don't forget, uh, you can email me or send me a text and let me know that you think I suck. You can let me know if you think I'm awesome. You can let me know um, topics that you'd like me to talk about. You can do that by sending me an email at joel, J-O-E-L, at fortressk9.com or by sending me a text. Remember, do not call me, but you can send me a text at 813-836-9244. What do I do if you call me? I just don't answer. What do I do if you leave me a voicemail? maybe, maybe I'll send you a text in the next six weeks, maybe. But if you actually listen to the message, it says, you should probably text me because I don't answer phone calls that I don't recognize. All right, guys, uh, with that, I hope you appreciate it tonight. I hope you uh, benefited from it a little bit. And until next time, remember to train hard and stay safe. Fortress Canine Podcast.